Welcome back, you guys. Uh, today we're going to talk about operant conditioning, another form of learning that will add to our information from classical conditioning. Uh, in this unit, we want to make sure that we can describe the types of reinforcement, and there's several different types of reinforcement, and how it affects behavior. One thing to remember in this part of our video, reinforcement always means that the behavior that brought about the reinforcement increases in frequency. So let's get started with opera conditioning. We're going to talk about some of the big psychologists in this part of the unit. Thorndike, who was known for instrumental learning. Skinner, who was known very well known for operant conditioning, which is what we're talking about, and his Skinner box. And Bandura, who is very well known for observational learning and his research with a Bobo doll. Now, these are all behaviorists, just like Pavlov was, just like Watson was, just like some of the other researchers we talked about in the previous part of our unit. They all believe that psychology should be an objective science that focuses on observable behaviors without reference to mental processes. Now, most modern, uh, most modern behaviors believe in the first part, but they don't necessarily believe in the second part of that statement. They do uh, they do agree that we should observe um, behaviors, but what they do also know based on recent research is that mental processes and cognition have become very important. So this poor little guy, he's wondering where his reinforcement is. He's in a Skinner box, and we'll talk about that famous Skinner box in the future. I remember operant conditioning, just like classical conditioning, is association learning. However, instead of associating two stimuli together, in operant conditioning, voluntary behaviors are controlled by their consequences. So it's like your behavior operates on the environment to get what you want to get away from or get closer to what you, or get what you want to get. So we associate a voluntary behavioral response with the con stimulus consequence from the environment. Remember, reinforcement occurs when a, a voluntary behavior brings about a pleasant consequence and an increase in the response rate of that behavior. So reinforcement always means there's a pleasant outcome and the behavioral response that brought about the consequence increases in frequency. So let's take a look at Thorndike. He was an early behaviorist and he's known for his puzzle box experiment in which he placed a cat in a turbocharged kennel-like maze. And outside of this maze, the cat could smell and see food so the cat had to learn to kind of get through some obstacles in order to get out and get a hold of that food. Over time, the behaviors that the cat exhibited seemed to be stamped in, and they could be used very quickly to, again, escape from that box. This is an example of association learning because the cat associated its behaviors with the consequence of getting closer to getting that food. That's often referred to as the law of effect. Thorndike said that if a behavior is followed by a pleasant consequence, it tends to be repeated. So if the cat was trying to get the food, any behavior that allowed it to get closer to that food was likely to be repeated in similar circumstances. So the puzzle box looks something like this. I have a short video to follow for you. I've never done a video on one of these things, so we'll see if that works out. But if not, I will upload it onto Edmodo. So Thorndike observed with several trials that the cat took less time to escape than previous trials, which led him to believe that the cat was learning to associate behaviors with escape. So let's take a look at this two-minute video, and we'll see if this works. But how is a new skill learned? That was a question which began to fascinate Thorndike. To answer it, he built some ingenious puzzle boxes from which cats could only escape by operating latches. And in you go. The cat appears to be very clever in engineering its escape, solving the problem with a deftly placed paw and a push of its nose.
But Thorndyke didn't believe that an animal, even a clever cat, understands the consequences of its behavior. When he placed a cat in the puzzle box for the first time, Thorndyke was unable to see any evidence of flashes of insight. The successful actions appeared first by chance. He proved that the apparent cleverness arose by trial and error, and used graphs to measure the rate of learning. A well-practiced cat quickly recalls the actions that help it escape to its reward of food. If an action brings a reward, Thorndike believed that that action becomes stamped into the mind. In his thesis, he explained further his ideas about learning, that behavior changes because of its consequences. He called this his law of effect, which explained how even wild creatures develop new habits. So there you have it. Let's hope that worked, uh, and you could hear everything. Otherwise, it's a long two minutes to sit and do nothing. But as we move on, remember the consequence of our behavior must be contingent or depend on the behavior occurring first. So in order for it to be operant, it, the, be, the consequence has to depend on the behavior. If the behavior doesn't occur, the consequence doesn't happen. So positive reinforcement is a type of reinforcement, and it occurs when a behavior leads to the arrival or addition of a pleasant consequence. That consequence is called an appetitive consequence. Appetitive means pleasant or desirable. So remember the word positive in this case means arrival of something. It doesn't mean good. It means your behavior led to the arrival of a pleasant consequence. Remember, reinforcement always means pleasant, and it increases the frequency of a behavior. So positive reinforcement occurs when a behavior leads to the arrival of some pleasant consequence. You put chocolate into your mouth, the consequence that arrives is good taste. It wasn't there before, or you're trying to maintain it, and eating that food brings about that appetitive, pleasant consequence. Negative reinforcement, you might be able to guess that if positive means arrival, negative means removal. But reinforcement, that's spelled wrong there, reinforcement, I'll have to fix that later, but negative reinforcement means a behavior leads to the removal uh, or subtraction of an unpleasant consequence. So the aversive stimulus is removed. Aversive means unpleasant. So in this case, if you take away something bad, that is good. So negative means take away or remove uh, behavior. So the behavior occurs, an unpleasant consequence is taken away, that means it's a good outcome. And the behavior is likely to occur again. Remember, negative means removal. So there's several types of negative reinforcement. One is escape behavior. This is when a behavior leads to the removal of an already unpleasant stimulus. So if you walk outside and it's raining and you're getting soaking wet and you put up an umbrella and it stops you from getting wet, that is negative reinforcement and it is escape behavior because the unpleasant stimulus is already there when you exhibit the behavior. And that makes sense. The unpleasantness is already there. It's taken away by your behavior. Avoidance behavior is a little bit different, though. It's still negative reinforcement, but this this type of behavior leads to the prevention of an unpleasant stimulus before it occurs. So let's say you hear thunder, or it's, it's really cloudy and windy outside, and you see some thunder and lightning. So before it starts to rain, you put up your umbrella, and you avoid getting wet in the first place. Well, the behavior of putting up the umbrella is followed by you staying dry and removal of unpleasant damp wetness. Um, this demonstrates cognition, right? A prediction. So this type of behavior demonstrates 
that cognition does matter in operative conditioning. Let's take a look at some other types of reinforcement. Primary reinforcers and secondary reinforcers. Primary reinforcers resolve biological needs. Primary means built in, unlearned. This consequence is innately satisfying. So you exhibit a behavior. That behavior leads to a innately pleasant outcome. For example, when you're thirsty, you drink water. That is innately satisfying. If you hurt yourself and you do something to get rid of the pain, that is innately satisfying. So anytime you remove pain or stress, that is a primary reinforcer. And when you're tired, you go to sleep, that is a primary reinforcer. Something that's really important here is that, remember, we're analyzing the consequence, what happens after the behavior. We are not analyzing the behavior. You probably have to learn the behavior that brings about uh, an innately reinforcing circumstance, but you don't have to learn that the outcome is pleasant. That's what we're talking about. A secondary reinforcer is something, it's a consequence that you have to learn is pleasing. So money has nothing innately satisfying about it, but if you exhibit a behavior and it gives you, brings you money, you know you can use money to get things that are pleasing to you. Or if you study getting an A on your report card, that's a secondary reinforcer because the A in and of itself is not innately satisfying to everybody, but you learn that it's pleasant and may bring about a pleasant outcome. Secondary reinforcement then, you have to learn the behavior um, and that it brings about a consequence, but is the consequence innately pleasing? Um, the consequence is what is labeled as a reinforcement, primary, secondary, positive or negative, not the behavior. So a lot of people think smoking, well, that's a secondary reinforcement because you have to learn how to smoke. But in reality, most research shows that smoking, although you have to learn it, actually innately removes anxiety and stress. So if you're stressed, and you smoke, and the stress goes away, is that innately satisfying? Yeah, because removing stress is always innately satisfying. No matter what you do, whether it's smoking or exercising or reading, it's still innately satisfying. So smoking is not secondary reinforcement. Some reinforcement extras quickly. I'm running out of time here. Timing of the reinforcement is very important. The closer in time the reinforcement occurs, the more likely we'll associate the consequence with the behavior. So just like classical conditioning, we're more likely to associate uh, a conditioned stimulus and an unconditioned stimulus if it occurs about a half second apart. That's pretty much similar in reinforcement. So if you do something and it's immediately followed by a pleasant consequence, you're more likely to associate them together. Intensity is also important. The more intense the consequence is, the more likely you are to associate the response and the stimulus. You'll more likely notice a $50 reward for driving the speed limit than 50 cents. Yay, I got, yeah, okay, I'm driving the speed limit, whatever. Um, money would be good in this case, but it would be a secondary reinforcer as well. So some reinforcement extras. Um, I'm going to back up here and we're going to stop. Uh, I'm running out of time and we'll finish up later. So back up and rewind if you need to. Um, positive, negative reinforcement, primary and secondary reinforcement, and Thorndike's puzzle box are the main points here. Uh, and I will see you soon.